Good evening. Welcome to our international speaker series. My name is Angela Zhang. I'm the director of the Center for Chinese Law at the University of Hong Kong. Today, I'm very pleased to introduce Suda Liu uh, from the University of Toronto to give us a talk on judicial corruption. Um, and before uh, we start, let me introduce today's um, speaker and discussant. So Suda uh, received his LLB degree from Peking University and his PhD in sociology from the University of Chicago. He joined the Department of Sociology from uh, at the at Toronto in 2016 um, after uh, teaching sociology and law at the University of Wisconsin. He, um, his research interests include the sociology, sociology of law, organizations and professions, criminal justice, globalization and social theory. It's really, really broad. And he has a, a conducted extensive uh, empirical research on China's legal reforms and legal professions. Um, and his current project examines China's influence on the legal professions in Hong Kong and Taiwan. Um, we have two wonderful discussions today. Uh, first is Professor He Xing, a uh, professor of law at our law department. He studies China's legal system from a socio-legal perspective. Um, he recently published a new monograph um, entitled Divorce in China, Institutional Constraints and Gender Outcomes. Um, last year, and he also had a Chinese book, um, and Professor He um, is a very good ping pong player and was the champion of the Central Western District of his age group in 2019. Um, we also have Ben Chan, um, who is also my colleague. Um, he's an interdisciplinary legal scholar uh, interested in regulatory and judicial institutions. Uh, so Ben graduated uh, with a JD from the University of California, Berkeley in 2017, where he also received his PhD in jurisprudence and sociology. So without further ado, let me give the floor to Suda. Thank you so much, Angela, for the very kind introduction. And it's my great pleasure to be here at uh, Hong Kong U Faculty of Law and see so many uh, familiar faces and names. And uh, I have a lot of friends uh, in the law school. Uh, so let me share my screen so we can get started. So what I'm presenting today uh, is uh, a titled Institutional Proximity and Judicial Corruption in China. Uh, so this is a, a, not a, a, a kind of a, a common paper that I, I, I wrote because a, a lot of my work, as many of you know, uh, are kind of focused on more empirical uh, research. But this is actually a more theoretical paper. Uh, we're trying to develop a, kind of a new theoretical perspective to think about judicial corruption, and also more generally the relationship between the judiciary and other social political institutions in China. So let me first say a little bit about the background of this research. Um, so uh, this, uh, my presentation is based on this uh, forthcoming article in governance that, that I wrote with Professor Wang Juan at the McGill, uh, a political scientist. Um, so, um, so this paper actually has a, there's a little story I, I wanna tell before getting into the content. Um, so I started to actually uh, work on this uh, in May 2020. Uh, you know, as many of you, you know, that's in the middle of the first wave of the pandemic. I was in New York City at the time. So as you know, New York City was the epicenter of the pandemic in uh, uh, in, in the spring of 2020, right? So, um, so at that time I was just staying at home, uh, kind of uh, feeling very depressed, unproductive, you know, not getting a lot of things done. And, and then, uh, just one day, uh, my, my co-author, Professor Wang, sent me an email and said, hey, I read a, a, a theory paper of yours called Between Social Spaces. I found some of the kind of ideas and concepts in that paper quite interesting and uh, potentially useful for, for some research I, I've been doing on, on judicial corruption in China. So do you want to actually talk and maybe collaborate on a paper? So when I got that email, it was like a, a, a flash of light in the middle of darkness. So like, uh, so all of a sudden I was kind of, I, I got very excited as sure, let's do this, right? So we basically spent the entire summer of 2020 writing up this uh, paper. We, we finished the first draft in September and uh, then we send, uh, send the paper to governance, this uh, very good political science journal in October, 2020. And we were extremely lucky, incredibly lucky. We got accepted. Uh, the paper got accepted in January, 2021. So it was almost like a record in my publication history, like uh, from writing the first draft to 
uh, to the paper being accepted. So as I, I told this little story uh, because I, I know Hong Kong uh, right now is in the middle of a uh, Omicron surge. So uh, probably many, many people are, you know, in the audience are also feeling a little depressed and uh, unproductive. So I, I just want to say that, uh, you know, even in these difficult times, uh, you know, good research, good scholarship can still be produced. So this is just an example that happened to us two years ago when uh, the North America was kind of in the, in the worst uh, first wave of the pandemic. All right, so going to the topic. So uh, of course, you know, this is about judicial corruption in China. So uh, uh, as many, many of you know, judicial corruption has always been a quite serious problem in China, at least for the past 20 uh, to maybe even 30 years. Right, so there are a lot of cases of judicial corruption. There are some very prominent cases. For example, I gave two examples on this slide. On the on the left side, there were five uh, judges in the Shanghai uh, High People's Court. Uh, you know, they were caught actually uh, on camera using prostitution together. Right, so that's kind of a obviously a, a very serious form of uh, corruption. And on the right side, of course, is another uh, even more prominent case. Uh, this judge, uh, his name is Huang Songliu. He used to be the vice president of the Supreme People's Court. Right. So, and then in 2008, he was uh, charged with bribery and eventually sentenced to a life in prison. This is the highest uh, rank of judges in China that was actually fell under a judicial corruption. But of course, these are just two very prominent cases. There are many, many much more mundane cases of judicial corruption ha happening on a, a regular basis. I think in almost every level of the court, yeah, every corner of the country, it's a, it's a very rampant a problem in China. For, for the past 20 years, I think the Supreme People's Court, the, uh, the government has been trying very hard to curb judicial corruption. Um, but until today, it remains a serious problem. But then of course, the, the question is how to explain this, you know, theoretically ju judicial corruption, especially from a, a social legal perspective, since I'm a, a sociologist of law. So, um, I mean, there, there, if you look at the literature, there are several different approaches for the explaining judicial corruption. So first of all, I mean, we define judicial corruption as the misuse and abuse of judicial power for personal gains and sometimes, you know, group gains, you know, so sometimes a group of, a group of judges uh, gain from corruption together, right? But then the question, of course, is judicial corruption an economic transaction between individuals or a social process across institutions? So this has been a, a major debate, I think, in the literature on judicial corruption, not just in China, kind of, you know, more general uh, literature on judicial corruption. There are two main approaches before we wrote this paper, um, you know, if you look at the literature. One is called the behavioralist approach. The other one is the institutional approach. So the behavioral approach basically uh, kind of, you know, almost like doing an economic analysis on the kind of the behavior of judges. In other words, how judges calculate uh, costs and benefits of kind of taking bribes or, or, or you know, like, or, or, you know, like the, the high salary versus low salary of judges, you know, pro, uh, uh, you know, provide different incentives, you know, for uh, related to, to a bribery, embezzlement, all these kind of other things. And also some, you know, the, uh, the, even the behavioral approach take into some institutional factors, for example, the, uh, the position of judges in the judicial hierarchy and et cetera. But that's kind of the, uh, the approach focusing on the individual behavior of individual judges, right? And the, there's another camp in the literature, um, what we call the institutional approach. So uh, this camp uh, basically focuses more on the issue of judicial accountability. In other words, they try to explain judicial co corruption by how autonomous or uh, how kind of uh, supervised the, uh, uh, the judiciary, the co uh, courts are and judges are, you know, by other institutions. So the general argument, if you look cross nationally, is that the more autonomous, the more insulated. Uh, the judiciary from other uh, political institutions, the more likely uh, corruption would happen. But of course, this doesn't work anywhere. In many authoritarian uh, uh, contexts, including China, you, you see it's actually the opposite. The more, uh, the less autonomous, less insulated, the actually more likely the, the corruption would happen. That actually goes uh, along with our approach. So in this paper, we try to develop, uh, you know, what we call a spatial or relational approach to, to judicial corruption, which is different from both. The behavior, uh, behaviorists and the institutional approaches. Why? Because both approaches try to identify some causes for judicial corruption. In other words, you know, there, there, there are some causes, like for example, uh, the low salary of judges or the kind of the, the, the uh, judicial accountability that actually uh, leads to corruption. What we're trying to argue is that we're not trying to identify a number of causes that you know leads to judicial corruption. Uh, rather, we try to situate uh, the judiciary, the court in the galaxy of 
other political and legal institutions. In other words, to look at the, the court as a, as a social space and see how this social space is related to other social spaces, right? So what do I mean by that? Of course, that leads to the kind of the keyword of this paper, what we call institutional proximity. So what is institutional proximity? So it's basically the social distance between uh, institutions, you know, the general definition. So to be more specific, to take the case of uh, say Chinese courts, right? So you think, think about a court, the court is related to many other institutions, right? In the political legal system and, and other parts of the, uh, China, uh, the government, for example, right? But the social distance between court and other institutions are not equal, right? For example, the court, uh, a, a court is probably very close to, for example, the bureaucracy or the po uh, police uh, bureau, right? Uh, a lot closer to, to these other political legal institutions than, for example, uh, than the uh, distance between court and the environmental bureau or the, uh, or the public health bureau. Right. So there, in other words, there are different social distance between uh, institutions. But so that's what we call institutional proximity. But proximity is not just about oh, measuring how far or how close uh, courts are with other institutions, but also more importantly about the dynamic social relations between these adjacent institutions. In other words, how do courts and, for example, the police or the political legal committee or uh, the, the People's Congress, all these other uh, institutions, adjacent institutions, how do they actually relate? How, to, how do they interact, right? So you, if you think about the uh, different types of uh, institutional proximity for courts, there are at least three different types. Uh, first is the proximity with other judicial and law enforcement institutions, say the, the police, the property, et cetera, right? And the second type is the proximity with other government offices. The first type is basically the proximity within the legal system, right? The second one is the proximity with say legislatures, government offices, political parties, right? I, I'm talking about just not just China, more generally kind of how courts can be approximate to other uh, institutions. So these are kind of the government uh, offices and, and the political parties. And the third type of uh, proximity is with other courts because every judiciary, every large country has a, has a you know, judicial hierarchy, right? So for example, if you're a district court, and then of course, you're also adjacent to other district courts and also to the intermediate court, to the high court in the same province or the same uh, jurisdiction, right? So that's kind of the, uh, the third type of proximity. So, so you can see really what we're trying to do is to situate a court and the judges in this court in the kind of the larger social spaces of all these other uh, political and legal institutions. And then try to use this uh, spatial perspective to, to explain and to understand judicial corruption. And then I also wanna highlight two kind of key concepts we're, we're using uh, to operationalize this theory. We, we call them link, linking ecologies and space travelers. So linking ecologies, um, you know, there's a, this is not a primarily a soci sociology audience, so I won't go uh, into the details of the theory, but linking ecology basically is a sociological concept developed in, uh, originally in the 2019 article on um, on taxi drivers in Warsaw, in Poland, right? So the idea is that uh, is, is, is this kind of uh, ecology that links other social spaces together uh, temporarily. In other words, it, it's kind of the intermediate ecology. It's a, it's, a, it's a space between other spaces that actually can link them together. For example, uh, cab drivers, you can see all the taxi uh, driving market. It's a, it's a linking ecology that linked uh, the space of work with the space of family, the space of uh, uh, religion, for example, all these other spaces together because people go back and forth, you know, uh, in and out of uh, this ecology. So that's an example of a linking ecology. So in our context, we're borrowing this concept to the context of the course. So linking ecology basically means what we mean here is the kind of all those little spaces or, or sometimes not so little spaces between courts and other actors kind of seek to influence judges, right? So for, I mean, there, there are all kinds of linking ecology, for example, higher level court, the prosecutor's office. These are all spaces that kind of, you know, related to judges, but also related to other actors that seek to interact with judges. And so, some of these are highly institutionalized, like, like the a court or a prosecutor's office or, or a police bureau, right? But other linking ecologies are, are seasonal or uh, temporal. For example, you know, uh, like Chinese judges, a lot of training sessions, right? So the training session, sometimes they will go to a party training, go to party school. That's a linking ecology too, because that's where, judges uh, meet a lot of other people, you know, other officials, other par par party cadres, and then, you know, th they will develop their network and then link, uh, leads to all kinds of uh, other kind of interaction. Or sometimes the local government hold some kind of policy event, 
for example, like a, a like a birth control uh, uh, campaign or or like a, 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 a like a environmental uh, campaign. These kind of things. Sometimes uh, courts also send staff to participate. So that's another kind of linking ecology through some kind of events that actually uh, link people together. So that's what we mean by linking ecologies. And but but that's kind of the the, the spaces. But there are also actors, of course, active in the in the process of judicial corruption. Um, you know, like, uh, in this paper, we talk about two kinds of actors, brokers and space travelers. Brokers are well known because you know, a lot of corruption activities involve kind of middlemen, right? The brokers are the people who actually use their positions and networks to connect judges with other actors who seek to influence them. So they kind of serve as the bro brokerage uh, in the whole process of judicial corruption. So that has been very well documented in the scholarship. But, but what we want to highlight in this paper is that there's another category of actors. You know, sometimes people lump them together with brokers, but we think they're actually a little different. We call them space travelers. So these are the people who actually move from one social space to another, either temporarily or permanently. So to give you some examples, for example, there are many uh, Chinese judges, at least used to be until recently, there was a, now there's a restriction on this. Uh, many retired Chinese judges uh, would retire from a court and then work as a consultant of a law firm or sometimes even practice as a lawyer in a law firm, or like a former prosecutor, for example, can go into politics. So they're basically moving from one, one institution to another, one social space to another, or a, a legal scholar. You know, many Chinese uh, law professors work as part-time lawyers, right? So they're moving from academia to, uh, to the legal service market, or you know, in some other context, it doesn't happen uh, often in China, a lawyer can be appointed to the, uh, to the bench as judges. Right. So all these kind of people are what we call space travelers. They move from one space to another, sometimes back and forth. Right. So th these people, we argue, also play very critical roles in the in the process of judicial corruption and also contribute to the institutional uh, proximity. So, you know, going into the context of Chinese courts, you can see there are many examples of these what we call linking ecologies and space travelers. For example, all the almost all the party major party state institutions like the party committee, Political Legal Committee, Zheng Fawei, People's Congress, Renda, CPPCC, Zheng Xie, you know, all these kind of formal institutions are linking ecology uh, between judges and other actors because many judges actually participate in these, uh, uh, in the activities of these uh, institutions. But also there are many kind of more kind of seasonal or temporal uh, like uh, linking ecologies I mentioned, for example, the party school, the training sessions, the task forces of governments, these are all linking ecologies. And another uh, thing I want to highlight which is the cadre transfer system, the um, uh, the zhidu in Chinese. So this is also a very important link ecology because it basically is a, it, it create a circulation of cadres, you know, uh, between different uh, party state institutions. So that that's also provide a space, I think, for judges to actually develop network with other people. So those are some examples of link ecologies in the Chinese context. Uh, space travelers for the you know in, uh, in the Chinese uh, case. The most prevalent form of uh, space travelers are the retired, resigned, or transfer judges, because uh, these judges used to work in the court for many years, and then they will uh, move to a government office or more likely move to a law firm, right? So a lot of these people play very critical roles in, in judicial corruption. Uh, but there are also other examples. For example, there are also examples of uh, party state officials transfer into courts. For example, many uh, sometimes uh, people used to work in the political legal committee or even work as the, for example, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the mayor of a city might move into a court. Now it happened less often than before, but it used to be that a lot of these party state officials will transfer into court. And then of course they bring kind of a lot of the, uh, their institutional ties into the court. And also another phenomenon I think often overlook is that many Chinese law professors actually using the cadre transfer system were also temporarily transferred into court. They will, they will uh, assume positions in, uh, in courts for like a, a year or six months. And they also develop uh, these kind of networks and sometimes also become hotbed for, political, uh, for, for judicial corruption. All right, enough about uh, theory. So, so let me uh, uh, move to the, uh, a few cases to give you a few examples of kind of how we uh, use this uh, institutional or spatial perspective to think about judicial corruption in China. Then I'll stop and uh, you know, I'd love to hear comments, right? So uh, in, this, uh, in this research, we collected data from two major sources. Uh, one source of course is Beidafabao, the pku law.com. This is a major uh, search engine. 
for legal cases in China. So of course we collected, uh, we just put in keywords like you know uh, judges, judicial corruption, uh, and, and then we, you, you can find actually quite a number of cases related to, uh, related to this. But of course the limit of the beta file is that you only see the judicial decision. You don't see the actual, the, the entire cases sometimes. So, so it's kind of a, a more limited. The most useful source that we use in this paper is actually my co-author Wang Zhen uh, collected. Is, uh, unfortunately it's not available online anymore. Uh, there used to be a, a, a law blog, Fa Lu Bo Ke, uh, hosted by the Supreme People's Procuracy, by the Zheng Yi Wang, the website of the Supreme People's Procuracy in China. And in that law blog, there's a whole uh, column called Tan Guan Dang An, called uh, uh, Corrupt Official Profiles. I and mean, you, you understand why these days is, it doesn't exist online anymore. <laughs> but it used to be that you know, within that Tan Guan Dang An, there was this uh, whole a, a blog by this uh, one former prosecutor. Uh, he actually collected more than 700 cases of judicial corruption. Basically judges, you know, for, you know, being charged because of corruption, right? So we collected, of course, all the seven, more than 700 cases. And, you know, compared to the Beta Fabo cases, these are better because they, it's not just the judicial decision. They actually, they collect media reports, all these things. So you can actually assemble the, almost the entire case scenario. Uh, from it. And of course, from it, we, we, not all the cases are so detailed, but we, because this is a qualitative study, we, we, our goal is not to be representative. And, and most of these cases are quite old. They were like at least 10 years, sometimes 20 years uh, ago that happened in the 90s or the, uh, or the 2000s. That's why they were kind of more uh, public, uh, public exposed. More recent cases are very hard to uh, collect. Uh, but uh, basically we, we, in the paper, we actually use four cases to illustrate what we mean by the institutional proximity, linking ecologies and uh, space travelers. For the sake of time, uh, I will just quickly go through three cases to give you a flavor of how to use our perspective to think about these corruption cases. So the first case, um, we call it the chairman's note. Uh, this is a case happening in 2003. Uh, so it's, a, it's a, a criminal case, it's a rape case. So a 16 year ago, uh, old girl in Henan province was raped by two men, Liang and Zhang. Right. And then, uh, of course, then afterwards, uh, this is just an ordinary case, kind of a, a criminal case that happened in the, in the district level. Right. So, uh, uh, and eventually the case outcome was, uh, the sentence was very light. Both the two defendants were sentenced to only three years with a three year probo uh, probation, which means that they don't even have to spend any time in prison. If they, they, they do well in the three year probation, they don't have to, you know, uh, actually go to prison. Right. So it's an extremely light sentence. So what happened? You know, like uh, if you look into what happened, is that uh, what happened is that one of the defendants, Zhang, uh, his father, uh, worked in the District People's Congress, the Qu Ren Da, right? District People's Congress. So after his son was arrested, of course, uh, the father actually talked to the chairman of the People's Congress, and then uh, the chairman, you know, of course, was willing to help his colleague, right? So the chairman actually uh, helped the father contact both the prosecutors and the judges uh, in charge of this case and told them to. Uh, uh, how how to manage the case well, right? So you, you know to to basically um, uh, in, in in Chinese there's a term called da zhao hu. Basically they they, they you know they they called upon these procurators and judges to um, you know make sure that they handle the manage the case well. In uh, in the meantime, the chairman also called the vice president of this court. So so the you know one of the court leaders was actually in charge of the entire uh, criminal division and and, and more. And then basically asked the vice president to help. And of course, the vice president was not stupid, right? So the vice president said, you know, sure, I can help. But, uh, uh, you know, uh, the vice president asked the chairman to give, give him a written note just to, to, just to make sure that if anything happens, right, if they give a light sentence and, you know, something happened, they will, the chairman, vice president can say, uh, you know, is, look, is the, you know, People's Congress chairman actually, uh, you know, told us to, to do this, right? And of course, the chairman was not, also not stupid. So well, he, he did uh, give a note to the vice president, but in the note, he said something very ambiguous. He said, Qing zhuo, Qing chuli. please handle this case as your discretion, right? So for, for, uh, for those of you who understand Chinese, you, know, you see this is a very um, um, kind of almost artistic <laughs> in the context of Chinese politics because the chairman didn't say anything wrong. He's just like, please handle the cases at your discretion. But of course, what, what he actually means is that to, to give a lighter sentence to the two, two defendants. And eventually that's what happened. The two, uh, two uh, defendants got lighter sentences. So if you look at this case, go back to our uh, theoretical point, 
is that a lot of people will say, hey, this is just a corruption. You know, you find a, a, a powerful person and that person kind of, uh, you know, talk to the judges, uh, lead to, uh, I also bribe the judges and then uh, leads to corruption, right? And, but what we want to emphasize here is that, you know, we can't, cannot overlook the role, the role of the People's Congress. You know, the District People's Congress was one of the linking ecology that we, we were talking about. Yeah, actually, because without this District People's Congress, Zhang's father wouldn't be able to actually reach the judges. So that's the kind of institutional proximity we're, we're talking about between the People's Congress and the court and the proc uh, procuracy in the same district, right? So that's just uh, case one. Case two, uh, we call it remote control from uh, Beijing. So this is a case uh, happening in 2000 in, in Guangxi. Uh, so uh, this is a case involving a police chief, former police chief who were kind of charged with cor you know, corruption himself. And then he was actually, uh, it was very serious. He was sentenced to death. And uh, after the death uh, sentence, he appealed, right? So during the appeal, uh, Wu, the police officer, uh, his brother actually, of course, was trying to uh, uh, save his brother, right? So he actually was just trying to, to find help, right? So the person he found, uh, was a uh, uh, the district party secretary of another city uh, named uh, named Bao, so and because he couldn't find kind of the any he didn't know anybody in his own in the own city that actually can um, can, can deal with this, but he found a district party secretary of another a different city, and then Bao, this district party secretary, uh, after he heard this case, he reached out to two first of all to two senior judges in in the intermediate court of his city. Right, because you know he, he's in another city, he know only know the judges in his city, right? And and uh, and then uh, the same district party secretary organized, uh, uh, you know, like basically through those two senior judges, talked to a uh, vice president Yang of the provincial uh, of the provincial high court of the Guangxi uh, Autonomous Zhuang Region High Court, um, and and then he basically he went to Nanning, uh, the provincial capital. To uh, hold a dinner with the vice president and, and the two senior judge of his city. Uh, basically, they had a banquet together, and then you know, during the dinner, he bribed uh, the vice president on behalf of the uh, uh, the defendant. Right, and then what happened to the vice president is that the vice president actually didn't do anything uh, right away. He actually waited until he was in a study session in Beijing. He traveled to Beijing for a study session, and when he was in Beijing, he actually uh, that's why we call it remote control. He actually made a phone call to the judges in the criminal division of this uh, high court because it's a death penalty case. So the second trial goes to the provincial high court, right? So he called the judges uh, uh, in the high court about the case. And then, uh, you know, then the judges basically after the phone call drop one of the charges and then give Yang uh, a suggested sentence of 10, 10, year, uh, 10 years in prison, right? So, so, and then of course, after the vice president went back from Beijing, the, the vice president also approved it and then that became the final. A decision. So you can see again, there are two ways you can look at this case. You can look at this case, oh, just this is like a, a bribery. A lot of bribery happens at dinner tables in China, right? So so that's kind of, you know dinner entertainment. You know that's why like the uh, five judges in Shanghai went to the prosecution. So a lot of these things, uh, you, we often blame. Oh, these are just you know you know these kind of dinner entertainment leads to corruption. But if you look harder. There are very important institutional foundations in the case as well, similar to the first case, but a lot more complex in this case, because this case, the institutions involved are quite uh, different. It's not just all in the same district. It's actually involved uh, the, a district party secretary of another city, and then the intermediary court of another city, and also the provincial high court, uh, you know, president of, of, of the province, right? And, and also involve a study session in Beijing. So all these things you can see, all these institutions work together to provide the, the, the space you know, for, for these people to interact, to eventually lead to, uh, lead to the judicial decision. So that's what we want to emphasize. Because if you just focus on the bribery at, at this dinner in Nanning, you miss a lot of the institutional foundation by, uh, you know, through which this corruption happens. OK, last case. This is a very simple case, but it's a, we thought it was fun. So we, we call it, it takes a village. Uh, this is an even older case in 1994. So it, this is a civil case. This is not a criminal case. It's a dispute uh, between a contractor and the village uh, committee in Shanxi province, right? So basically, the contractor, you know, uh, kind of uh, contracted the, the mine uh, near the village, and then the village committee was unhappy with the uh, with the contractor. And what happened is that the uh, the village committee actually held a village wide consultation. So the entire village was uh, on board. Kind of they held a meeting, you know, discuss what to do. 
and eventually, uh, eventually the village decided to appoint four representatives to do what? To bribe judges. <laughs> basically, the, the village basically decided we're going to bribe the judges win this case. And then, so the four representative actually uh, in the first trial bribed the judge, but still the court ruled actually in favor of the contractor. So they lost the first trial. So afterwards, the village committee actually, uh, uh, they need more money for bribery. So they actually raised money from the villagers and also borrowed money from the bank uh, you know, for, to bribe judges. So the, the, this is a, during the second trial. But then the, 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 the representative of the village realized that you cannot just rely on anybody to bribe judges because judges do not take money from you know, random people, right? Chinese judges are precisely because corruption is so prevalent. So they're actually quite uh, cautious and careful you know, in these things, although they do take, many of them take bribes, right? So in the second trial, they actually found a lawyer. They hired a lawyer who recently retired from the intermediate court the court in charge of the, uh, the second trial, right? So, so this lawyer is what we call space traveler, right? So, so Gao, this lawyer, because he, he just, you know, he just moved from, a, from the same court, uh, you know, to, uh, to the legal profession, right? So uh, what happened is that Gao discussed the case with, the, of course, the court leader, his uh, kind of former colleagues, and also, you know, like direct the villagers to bribe two, two judges in the second trial uh, in the intermediate court. And so eventually the, the, the village actually won the second trial, the intermediate court ruled in favor of the village in the second trial. And this is a very typical, it's a very simple case, but it's a very typical story. A lot of the judicial corruption in China happened through these so-called space travelers who used to be in the court and now moved somewhere else, or you know, who used to be somewhere else now moved into the court. All right, so to quickly conclude, um, so what we're, we're trying to uh, say is that uh, you, you can see from these three cases, a lot of judicial corruption has an institutional foundation. So what we call these linking ecologies and space travelers function as the key bridge, key bridges, you know, in the social interactions of, you know, judicial, uh, by which the social interaction of judicial corruption take place. So that's actually really uh, kind of the, the, the main, main takeaway from the paper. And my final point I want to say, then I'll stop, is that um, if you take this actually spatial or relational approach, once you take uh, seriously uh, institutional proximity, then you realize judicial corruption actually follows the same logic of many other kind of political, uh, political actions. Because if you think about, you know, to, to a lot of extent, what we're showing, uh, you know, in the case of judicial corruption, is just how Chinese institutions work. You know, a lot of these connections between court and the, say the uh, People's Congress or the, uh, the political legal committee or other things, we have many other cases uh, we could talk about. Th these are just how, you know, the, the judicial bureaucracy and the larger political, uh, larger Chinese bureaucracy work. And it is the same logic of bureaucracy that actually lead, give rise to many productive things, but also give rise to, you know, uh, un, uh, kind of illegal or unethical things like judicial corruption. So I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Suda, for the fascinating talk. I have a lot of questions to ask you. Um, but before uh, I open the floor uh, for audience to ask questions, let me introduce Professor He Xing to give his comments. Oh, thank you so much, uh, Angela, uh, for inviting me. And, and, and it's so nice uh, to, 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 to be here to comment on Suda's paper. Um, uh, well, I, I know I know Sula very well, but uh, every time uh, I read his 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 uh, his work, his paper, and I always get inspired. Uh, let me let me first uh, paraphrase uh, Carl Sunstein's comment on uh, Richard Posner. Right, so um, Professor Liu uh, writes faster than uh, I can read. Right, so the uh, it's it's very difficult for me to catch up what what he has published like I mean maybe four or five particles each year right so and then all all this with the new uh, theoretical perspective and, and, and empirical data extremely uh, extremely insightful and 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 actually inspiring right uh, I am an amateur sociologist I, I although I do so-called the law and society right so um, I, I I'm not trained as a, a sociologist even though um, uh, I devote a lot of time. I devote a lot of time uh, to study it. Right? So uh, I may be called a professional uh, ping pong player. Right? So um, in terms of the time I input, right? So not not in terms of the skill that uh, I reach. Right? So but, but anyway, that you see the contrast. So uh, 
uh, I'm here. I'm here to learn, right? So and try to make some uh, questions. Uh, some of them may be very silly. So the, I hope um, uh, you understand that. And then uh, let me let me uh, let me uh, study a little bit. All right. So uh, the the paper uh, offer really offer a new perspective look at judicial uh, corruption, uh, which is very common uh, phenomena. So. Uh, to, uh, to, to complement behavioral and institutional approaches, it suggests a spatial approach, right? So, and, and basically it's called institutional proximity. Uh, that, that simply means a place of social interaction, right? So, and then uh, the social foundation paves the way to facilitate corrupt, uh, corrupted activities, uh, specifically uh, linking ecologists and space travelers and to mechanisms for uh, corruption to occur, right? So uh, as to the Chinese court, uh, the authors uh, uh, actually uh, list three types of institutions that are proximal, right? So high level courts, a party of, and, and government organizations at the same administrative level and, and other, other type of uh, organizations, right? So, and then he, they used uh, four examples to illustrate uh, the two mechanisms, right? So uh, about the occurrence of the judicial uh, uh, cor uh, corruption uh, activities. Uh, so uh, it is it is it is something uh, quite different from the traditional approach. Uh, usually, like I mean, uh, from from my background, right, and my knowledge, uh, we try to understand uh, corruption uh, usually by network or guanxi. Right. So the, I see, like I mean, the, the, I have guanxi with somebody, somebody else. Then if I, I have a case, then maybe I have to approach those people and try to influence the decisions, right? So, so now here comes the spatial approach, right? So, and, 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 it, and, and it is totally new, right? So, the, so we have to, like for me, like I have to, I have to try to understand uh, what's the difference it makes, right? So, and then the, to what extent they deepen our understanding, right? So to what extent is helpful, right? What new we, we have seen from this different perspective? Uh, I have three uh, questions to ask. Uh, the first is uh, how to how to define um, institution. Uh, you call it institutional proximity, right? So um, uh, it is an elusive word uh, for amateur like me, right? So uh, uh, it seems to be very vague and broad, right? So um, when when you list three uh, type of uh, institutional proximity, I'm, I was puzzled, right? Why you didn't include a legal profession? Uh, I noticed you've mentioned that at the early part of a paper, but actually in, in the more elaborate part uh, in the, uh, about the introduction of the Chinese uh, institutions, uh, you, 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 didn't, you didn't mention that, right? So, uh, so isn't the lawyer or the legal profession one of the most close uh, institution that um, socially uh, to the judges, like uh, your own study has demonstrated, right? So, uh, and, and interestingly, you said in the case number four, and I mean, it takes a village and you, uh, you explain that in your talk as well. So you said that there's no linking uh, ecologist because between uh, the village collective and the judges, it seems that um, they are separated, right? But if you include legal profession as a, a linking, uh, uh, as, a, as, as, a, uh, as an institution, then basically, I mean, it's overlapped, right? So the, the lawyers can do the dirty job. The, the, the dirty job, right? So they, they can they can easily like I mean com communicate and help that. Or I use your own word, uh, broker uh, the deal, right? So then the, the more general question is how to define the institution, right? So is it just a platform uh, in which the judges could possibly know each other? Uh, or does it include other type of things? I mean, institution is it could be very broad. A family is an institution, right? So. Um, we, uh, people kill to take the bus is an institution because you regulate people's behavior, right? So, and then uh, um, uh, draw some boundaries, right? So, um, so in that case, the media is an institution. So does the platform say include um, social media such as Zoom, um, such as WeChat, right? So are they, are they WeChat friends? So, um, and then are they uh, the institution uh, proximal? Um, closed, right? So, so, so there are many things. So how to draw the boundary? Where's the line, right? So that's my first question. So the second, 
Um, to what extent does institutional proximity tell us more about the likelihood uh, of club activities? Uh, at least from the examples you show, like I mean, uh, that um, they, they, they can all be explained by the existence of network or guan xi, right? So, uh, so to what extent uh, the new spatial approach deepen uh, the understanding? You, you, you does mention that uh, you do mention that if the size and exclusive exclusivity of the linking ecology may explain the convenience of communication, right? So, so. But to what extent, I mean, it shows that in those examples, like, I mean, so the, uh, th there are many type of um, uh, uh, linking ecology, and we can also use, say, uh, uh, the Guanxi type of word, strong tie or weak tie, uh, supervisory tie or non-supervisory tie, right? So, so there are many things. That, and, then, and then actually those ties would include something even beyond the instit institutional approximate you just mentioned. Because many things are personal. It doesn't have to be uh, uh, the, within the range of the institution you just mentioned. Right? So it seems to me like, I mean, uh, institutional approximate uh, pro provide a necessary condition for corruption activities to occur. Uh, but it says very little about the necessary condition. Right? It's, I mean, it's provide, pro it, it doesn't say much about the sufficient uh, condition. Right? So it provides a foundation. All these are. Right. If, if, if there's no con contact at all, of course, there's no corruption. Like, I mean, never, never, never know each other, never, never have any way of con uh, connection, right? So then, but, but it seems that uh, you didn't say much about uh, what would be sufficient for that to occur, right? So the, uh, for, for network or guanxi, like the different approach, the existing traditional approach, then uh, one can, further divide them into different types, say, um, as I just mentioned, strong tie or weak tie, right? So institutional tie or cultural tie, uh, supervisory tie or non supervisory tie, right? So then uh, how are you going to uh, divide, uh, further uh, define uh, or refine uh, institutional proximity, right? So um, what type of uh, institutional proximity is actually closer or so, like, I mean, it's easier uh, to have uh, the deals like I mean they have. So the it seems to be a new uh, perspective, right? So, uh, but the, you you need to perhaps you need to sharpen uh, the, the analytical tool, right? So to see how it actually becomes more useful, and then uh, get uh, to the to the heart of the question, the the, the, the hard core of the question uh, closer, right? So. Uh, to use a metaphor, I mean, the guanxi may be like a threat, like I mean, one point linking uh, the other point, uh, but institutional proximity seems to be a block. Is this an institution, right? So uh, to what extent it tell us how the real transaction occurs, right? So then uh, bring us to the third uh, question. So uh, to what extent institutional proximity explain valuations? So uh, those examples are basically from the pre, pre uh, Xi Jinping period, uh, which is fine, right? Some from the 2000s and some from the 1990s, right? So, the, but, but the, the obviously, like, I mean, uh, today, I mean, the corruption is, remains a big problem, but we all know that after Xi, uh, corruption becomes less visible at least, if not reduced heavily, I mean, significantly reduced. But, the institutional proximity you described remains the same, right? And the linking ecologies are exactly the same, if not more, right? I, I, there's maybe more training sessions and conference, right? So, and, and more professors are appointed at the SPP or SPC, right? So this is, it's, it's as usual, but right? actually the amount and extent of uh, corruption may decrease significantly, right? So um, why? The traditional approach of Guanxi, however, can explain that easily, right? So uh, they would just say, hey, uh, the political climate changed. You reprise, reprise the operation of Guanxi network, right? So uh, to use uh, 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 Feng Yuqing and, and his co-author's work, they, they, they just published one piece about the judicial corruption uh, in Hong Kong Law Journal. They said that originally it is uh, 
old world Guan Xi, uh, now it becomes cold world, right? So it becomes less visible, right? So uh, indeed, if you look, look beyond China, like I mean, US and Hong Kong court also have a lot of institutional proximity with other organizations, right? So, uh, and linking ecologists and space travelers too, right? So, but the level of corruption of those places, nothing compared to that in China before, at least before Xi Jinping, right? So, so the difference between this code and Chinese course is not really the presence of institutional proximity, right? So I, I believe this maybe is just the human ecology of the judges, right? So um, with whom they go to lunch, right? So have dinner, go outing and have foot massage, right? So maybe that's the, that's the key. Like it's not really institutional proximity, right? So it is really the human ecology, how those people interact with each other, right? So it's not really how close the institutions are, right? So, so the key in the, uh, from, I mean, from my understanding, uh, the key in the spatial approach is not just the structure um, of the spatial architecture, uh, but also the interactions between the microorganisms, right? So the, your paper, of course, uh, I mean, uh, the data uh, is, uh, is, is, is limited. Right? So you have to get that from the, from the, from the, uh, uh, the website and then it has been a little bit uh, old, right? So, but the point is that uh, it will be helpful if you look, discuss more about the cultural dimension, right? So like the thing I just mentioned, right? So, and then linking ecology may also deserve more exploration, right? So the, it's really how do those people do, like, like the taxi driver do between those families um, and, 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 and religious groups, I and mean, then how those, those say the church set the time and the states change the, uh, the, 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 the daytime or work time or the holidays and this, this kind of a thing, right? So it's, it's, it's not just the presence, the habitat itself, right? So the desert, the oasis or forest um, gives us some rough ideas what's going on out there, right? So, but you want to see more the interactions between various kinds of animals, birds, insects, Right, so the likewise. So what space travelers are doing actually is more important than the mere existence of such travelers. So in that sense, maybe we have to go back and and, and to try to inter, in, integrate uh, what you call the spatial approach with the original institutional uh, behavior approach or even the cultural approach. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Frank, um, for the very um, insightful comments. And then um, you actually actually make some of the comments I want to ask. Um, so let me uh, give the floor to Ben. Hi. So thank you so much for sharing this paper. And uh, to be honest, you know, my first encounter with this paper was in October 2020. And, and the reason for that, uh, so that you're laughing, uh, is I don't think I'm breaking any rules because the paper's accepted uh, and it is, it's going to be in print. Uh, uh, the reason for that is I was reviewer one, actually. And reviewer one, as all of you know, is a nice guy. Uh, but I didn't say nice things uh, because I was reviewer one. Uh, I was genuinely very uh, interested and impressed by the paper. And so I'll say a little why, uh, and then I'll pose some questions to you. You know, you have my other comments from maybe one year ago. Uh, but the questions I'll ask you here maybe might be more kind of theory oriented, more big picture. So the reason why I like this paper is because there has been a lot of work on judicial corruption. But the accounts, you know, they tend to be institution centered or individual centered. You name it a little differently, I remember in the paper. Uh, but for me, you know, an, an, an institutional kind of uh, structural account would be like Li Ling's paper, right? How, why is there so much corruption in Chinese courts? And she says, oh, that's because of the mechanisms the party state has built into the courts, right? It's built this certain mechanism into the courts to allow it to intervene in any arbitrary case. And these same mechanisms can be exploited uh, by senior judges uh, to kind of uh, promise right, this kind of uh, corrupt uh, bargains, right? So that's one approach. And the other approach uh, is the kind of more individual personal uh, approach. And I think it's exemplified by some of Professor Hersen's work, right? So he didn't talk too much about it, but he also kind of looked into judicial corruption in Chinese courts. And he looked at it from the perspective of Guan Xi, right? And although his analysis was a network analysis, ultimately it was still very much centered on the individual, right? Who do you know, right? Is it a strong tie, a weak tie, a supervisory tie, a non-supervisory tie, right? And when the ties are not so strong, 
you know, then one of the parties has to protect themselves, right? This kind of rational individual, you know, cost benefit analysis kind of thing. And what I liked about uh, this paper was that it presented, I think, a genuinely new kind of approach. And so I'm going to maybe push back a little what, uh, back a little what uh, Professor Hersin said. Uh, and what, what I found kind of insightful about it is if you think about it, right, every time we want to bribe a judge, we have to know the judge, corruption is going to really slow down to a trickle, right? It's going to be hard for people, ordinary people, to just randomly know judges. Right? So you need to know someone who knows them. And how does that come about? Well, that comes about because of institutions, right? So of course, you can debate about the definition, the boundaries of this term, right, institutions. But for the purposes of this paper, I think what institutions, you know, what their concept is doing, institutions are basically just, you know, uh, they have this convening power, right? They bring stream of people into periodic contact with each other who are part of, who are members of their respective institutions. And from there, a link is established, right? The two institutions become close because they have these frequent discourse, uh, meetings, exchanges. And from there, you, you get an entry point right, to the judiciary. So if you're thinking of bribing a judge, you think of influencing the outcome of a, a judicial case, but you don't have to know someone in the court, right? You, you, you just have to reach someone in one of the proximate institutions. And because institutions have this convening power, right, because there's this discourse between the institutions, you can move you know, from this entry point to your destination, which is the courts. And that's what I, I like about this paper. You know, it, it kind of, at least to me, it, it, it's not the whole explanation, right? It doesn't pretend to explain why there's judicial corruption in China and not, well, why there's more judicial corruption perhaps in China than in other countries, right? But it at least gives you some insight into why it is happening on such a scale because of the proximity of the courts to other uh, institutions. Okay, so that's what uh, I like about a paper. Uh, I have several comments and I, I actually saw you incorporated my comments from the referee report. I, I hope those comments made the paper better. <laughs> but, but, but here I'm gonna ask you some even bigger picture. Uh, uh, questions, right? Questions not just about judicial corruption, because it seems to me this theory can be applied to a lot of things. And so one of the questions I want to ask is when we think about judicial corruption and institutional proximity, right? We think of, okay, courts are the final destination. How do we get into this ecology and from there, you know, find a way to the courts? That's the destination. Is it possible to invert this, right? If we think about proximity, you know, let me just put on my mathematical hat for a minute, right? If we think about a distance, right? A distance in a sense is commutative. What does that mean? Well, the distance from A to C is the same as the distance from C to A. Right? So strictly speaking, or logically speaking, right? If we think of courts not as the final destination, right? But as a member, a part of the ecology, could you have an entry point into the courts and reach somewhere else? So for example, could you approach a judge and then get to a member of, you know, the local, uh, People's Congress. And that, that I think would be a very interesting follow up to this paper, right? Because if this is truly an ecology, there's truly this cycling, uh, then it should be possible to do that. But when I, think about my, when I think about it that way, well, okay, then I think distance, the way I've explained it is 2D, right? Maybe distance is 3D, right? Certain institutions are more powerful than others, right? So even though they're close on a 2D map, on a 3D map, it's much easier to move from one to the other. Right, so uh, you know, if you're, you're bottom of the hill, it's harder to go up, but the top of the hill, it's easier to go down, even though on a 2D kind of uh, uh, perspective, distance is the same. And I wonder if that's true, right? Because I think about judicial corruption in the US, okay, people do pay judges, but a lot of judicial corruption happens when people approach judges to approach the police for a favor, right? And, and, and that seems quite easy because judges have that prestige, uh, that respect in the United States. And so I wonder if, if you know, any of these thoughts might kind of uh, help build this theory. The second question, again, a very broad question, is I don't think your account is a normative account in the sense that you're not trying to prescribe anything, you're trying to describe. But at the end of the paper, you have this uh, line and you basically say, um, let me pull it up, right? battling against corruption, seeing in this light requires not only measures specifically, specifically targeted at corruption, but holistic changes of related political institutions. Uh, I think you added this in the, in the revision. And so I, I wanted to kind of uh, invite you to expand a bit on this, right? What kind of uh, changes to political institutions you think might be required? Because it seems to me very drastic, right? The, the kind of uh, institutional proximity uh, we are talking about, it can be used for good and also for evil, right? It can be used for private gain, but also public benefit. So isn't it really a blunt instrument with which to battle corruption, right? Shouldn't we maintain that proximity, but use other means of detecting of, of staving off uh, corruption. Uh, so those are my uh, big questions and uh, I look forward to uh, the discussion. 
Thank you very much. Um, so uh, we have very limited time left, and then um, Suda, um, the presentation attracted a lot of uh, questions from the audience. I wonder if uh, Suda would like to give um, will respond first to to the two discussants or before we we I start asking questions from the audience. Sure. Let me give a very quick two minutes uh, response, uh, and then we can, you know, hopefully get to some audi audience questions. Uh, Professor He Xin's three points are all very well taken. Uh, let me just clarify: uh, we define institutions quite narrowly in this paper. What we, we mean, we, we're not taking the anthropological definition of institution, which is like including all these kind of other things, like family, media, uh, not even the legal profession. In this uh, paper, we define institutions just like the government agencies or offices, kind of these kind of, you know, kind of taking the more like the political science uh, version of the narrow definition of the institution. Uh, so I hope that clarifies things. Um, I, I think in terms of, uh, you know, how this relates to networks or guanxi, uh, we, we're not, I mean, as, as Ben said, we, we're not trying to kind of uh, argue that the guanxi approach, is, there's anything wrong with the guanxi approach. We're actually totally in support of that approach. And then there have been like a decade long research about this, about judicial corruption in China, including some of Professor He Xin's own work and Li Ling's work, uh, many excellent research. What we want to uh, add here is just, there's actually an institutional foundations uh, from which these networks came into being. Because without the what we call institutional proximity between court and all these other institutions, you wouldn't see these kind of networks develop as easily as they are. But as Professor He Xin said, yes, some network can develop without uh, institutional proximity. But if you if you observe empirically, I think the majority of them has something to do with the proximity of uh, institutions. Uh, Professor Hussein's third question is actually a very, very difficult one, which is how to explain the variations. Does the theory actually explain the variations, especially kind of, you know, if you compare the pre C and post C uh, eras, right? So I think my response would be that uh, I, I think the anti-corruption campaign that uh, Xi Jinping started in uh, 2013, 2014, it's more like an exogenous shock to the to not just the judicial system, to, to the Chinese bureaucracy more generally. So of course, that kind of big exogenous shock is hard, uh, it's you know like our theory focus on the internal uh, kind of uh, spatial and relational uh, things within the uh, within the bureaucracy cannot really explain exogenous shock, right? So of course, exogenous shock is more convincing uh, explaining the variations. But I, I like Professor He Xin's point about the human ecology part of this because that's that's more like a data limitation. You know, as you well know, I'm a, you know, I'm a Chicago trained sociologist, so I, I often take the ecological approach to these things. But unfortunately, our data is archival data. We can only focus on the kind of the more unfortunately more static aspect of the institutional proximity. And yeah, in the future, if data is available, I we 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 would love to actually look at exactly what you said, how these actors. How these brokers, back tra uh, space traveler, actually interact in real time. You, you know, foot massages, you know, dinner, dinner tables, all these things, and how their institutional proximity actually leads to these kind of uh, uh, interaction and, and the formation of networks. Um, and uh, uh, Ben's question. Uh, let me just quickly answer the second one. What kind of changes can I see? I think if we take the institutional proximity seriously, I think there are uh, things that I think, for example, you. You know, like we were like as a Supreme People's Court, we can think about how to reduce the unnecessary interactions between judges and some other institution. You know, like you know, for example, do, do judges have to go to certain kind of events and, and meet all these other people, right? But that's limited, I think. I mean, the fundamentally, as Professor Kuxin said, these kind of institutional proximity are built into the bureaucracy itself. It's really hard to change. I'll stop here. So we have a couple of minutes for questions from the audience. Thank you very much, Sada. You did really well. You know, it's a very short period of time responding to the both discussions. Um, so um, my colleague Clement, I think this is my colleague Clement Chen, uh, also uh, have a question here. Uh, many thanks for your paper, which shed new light um, on the interaction between judges and other actors in officialdom. I wonder if there will be different levels or layers of proximity. If yes, whether those levels are stable or fluid in the various linking ecologies, would some be usually more influential than others? So for instance, party school classmates vis-a-vis -vis ex-colleagues in the same court? Yes, absolutely. You're absolutely right. And that actually get, go back to Ben's first point about the 3D space rather than the 2D space. 
yes, kind of, you know, if you think about like the, like all the institutions related to judges, they're not equal, right? As I said, some of them are closer to, to the court than others. And also some of them are more powerful uh, than others. For example, the, uh, like the district or municipal party committee or the political legal committee, certainly more powerful than the People's Congress or the, CP, or, or the uh, CPPCC, the Zhengxia, right? So there are different kind of power relationships you can analyze uh, in these institutions and also different hierarchies, like which, like our second case I can illustrate, which level uh, of the hierarchy, whether it's the provincial level, municipal level, district level, all these things uh, matter. Uh, actually greatly. And, and that's, I think, uh, we, we, that's the, the point we didn't cover in the paper, but, you know, if there's another paper, I think we'd love to look at those variations, kind of convert the th a 2D space into a 3D space, as Ben said. Great. So there is one more uh, question from uh, Vivian. Um, she's interested in your comments on a very current um, in current affairs uh, involving a very famous case of a woman in chains. Um, and even though the criminal law stipulates serious sentence for trafficking, uh, but those husbands, so-called husbands, receive very lenient um, sentence for the rape, illegal detention, and other offense. And she speculated there might be judicial corruption in those kind of cases. How do we rebuild confidence in the court? Um, that's a very important question. Uh, I, I think there are, of course, public outrage uh, after what happened in, uh, to that chain a woman in Xuzhou. Uh, but um, I mean, I'm not in the loop. I never studied kind of these judicial decisions. Uh, it, it's possible there's corruption involved. But I think uh, the bigger problem is, I mean, in this particular case, it's not really judicial corruption. I think it's the kind of a wider cultural and social tolerance of certain kind of criminal behavior. Right. So, so, I mean, if you look at the, I mean, there's this debate whether the, for example, the uh, article uh, 241 of the criminal law, whether that's actually severe enough to prevent this kind of human trafficking cases. But I, I think the problem is not really in the law itself. You know, like uh, the, all, almost all of us are here, are law and society scholars, is really the enforcement of the law. And, uh, you know, there could be corruption involved, but I think the bigger problem is really that a lot of the uh, criminal law was actually not enforced. Uh, for because of cultural and social barriers. That's a much harder problem to, to tackle than uh, curbing judicial corruption. But of course, that's a bigger topic for another day. Well, thank you. I, I remember uh, Professor He Xing has uh, written a, an excellent uh, essay on this in his Chinese blog, Wen Xing Diao Long, right? I mean, uh, and and I remember his comment. It was a pretty cool sentence. He said, you know, it seems like law is for Guizhu. But in this case, it's not really about the law, right? And um, yeah, I really enjoy the essay. I will, I will uh, recommend it to Vivian. Um, so uh, we are, our, our talk is coming to an end. And uh, I, I want to thank Suda for, for getting up so early uh, to come and present this wonderful paper. And I learned a, a great deal myself being a, uh, uh, the only non-law uh, and sociology scholar in this panel. Um, and I, I thank uh, Frank and Ben for, uh, you know, taking their time during Friday uh, evening uh, to, to come and comment on this paper. And I thank the audience for joining us. Uh, so look forward to see you guys next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming.